So Apologia uh, issued a, a moral challenge to Christians. It's always so flattering when the bigger names in Christianity consider my videos to be worthy of some kind of response. Normally I would not have paid any attention to this channel or this moral challenge. Uh, I'd never heard of the channel before. Well, that's less flattering. There's a misunderstanding in almost everything he says. In almost everything yeah, he almost says. almost everything? Looks like I'm in trouble again. Welcome to Apologia. Apologia or Apologia, I don't know, I don't know how he pronounces Apologia. his... Apologia. Where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. If you're new to the channel, why not take a second to tap on the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when new science, theology, and news videos come out. Last November, I posted a video entitled Morality Challenge for Christians, which was an expansion of a tweet of mine asking what should be a basic questions to Christians regarding morality. For several weeks, the hundreds of responses I received were either examples that didn't apply or criticism about something unrelated to answering the question. Then suddenly, I got a stream of responses, each using the words epistemology and ontology, where previously no responses had used these words. Hardly a coincidence, David Wood of Act 17 Apologetics and Michael Jones of Inspiring Philosophy had done a live stream going through my video. You don't seem to understand the difference between moral epistemology and moral ontology. So that's where that came from. I'm actually very excited that two philosophers... I am a philosopher. Michael is a philosopher. Amateur. Um, of their respect and reputation would talk about this, giving me a chance to address it again with some lessons learned and with a little less obfuscation and ambiguity since my thoughts won't need to be phrased in the form of a question. What is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? You got it. And perhaps a chance to demonstrate that there was some method to my madness. All right, so we're going to go and look at this video. The video's a bit longer. Longer? It was just nine minutes. The Act 17 live stream addressing it was 90 minutes long. To try to keep this video reasonable, I'm just going to be hitting the highlights of what I felt were the most relevant portions of their hour and a half response. But, as always, the link to the video is in the description. And please, let me know in the comments if you feel I misrepresented them in any way. Wait, I'm not saying that there's something... Uh... In, that they're intentionally misrepresenting the arguments, right? No. I think uh, it's just that they really just don't seem to understand what the arguments are. See? I'm not malicious. I just don't understand. Apologia is actually a po Apologia and Shannon Q. Mm -hmm. Just was on their channel for the debate on Divine Indus. Great atheist. Nothing yeah. against them. I think yeah, his, his, video sound, his video sounds like he's trying to be as reasonable as possible, yeah. not, trying to be, not trying to get nasty or not trying to be insulting and so on. And right back at you, Michael. We've had excellent conversations, both public and private. We may not agree with each other, but I respect his intellect, his integrity, his methodology, his production value, his intentions, and he has a sharp sense of humor that isn't always evident. And David? Well, we're just meeting. That's the only uh, Apologia video I've seen. Hopefully this will be a second one. Since I already spoiled the ending a little, you might yourself be wondering what is meant by moral ontology and moral epistemology. Fortunately, Michael took time at the start of the stream to provide some groundwork. Michael is trying to be very careful in defining his terms. So, meta-ethics, what do we mean by morality? Objective, subjective, cognitive, non-cognitive. Normative ethics looks at what we ought to be doing. Now, moral ontology. And this looks at what morality is. What is the nature of morality? Are moral values and duties irreducible? Like, they just simply are fundamental they are? Are they emergent from some sort of natural phenomenon? Are they simply non-existent, like a nihilist would say? Okay, so, if they exist, where do they come from and what are they grounded in? How do we know what is moral? That's what a moral epistemology is looking at. Is it intuitive? Is it something we have to discover in nature? Uh, how do we know? So these are the four basic areas I want to focus on tonight, because when I watched Apologia's video, I saw a lot of jumping in between these different branches, and that to me was an issue. And I want to emphasize the moral argument. When we're talking that morality is grounded in God, it's only about moral ontology. It's got nothing to do with the other th three uh, areas of study I've mentioned tonight. Now, despite a lot of admonition toward me for imprecision, misunderstanding, and a lack of putting forth a clear case, 
When we talk about atheist arguments, we try to represent them accurately. Then we play this video, which, which is a massive misunderstanding of the moral argument. At no point in the stream did Michael or David actually lay out their moral arguments as a point of clarification or contrast. Fortunately, toward the end, IP pointed viewers to the God, Morality, and Ethics playlist on his channel. And then I also present the moral argument in that series. And since, like David and Michael, I want to be precise, Let's go directly to the video they linked to. Premise one, morality is a rational enterprise. This premise is not too controversial. Premise two, moral realism is true, meaning moral facts and duties exist. This is the most controversial premise, and most skeptics will deny this one. Indeed, and I am one of them. This is the premise I have a problem with and will be focusing on entirely here. Premise three, the moral problems and disagreements among humans are too much for us to assume moral facts and duties are grounded in a human source of rationality. Premise 4. Moral facts and duties are grounded in a necessary rational source. So this would simply follow to premise 5. This source, whoever this would be, is what we call God. Now to talk about the second premise, we need to hop elsewhere in the playlist to get his explanation of moral realism. Moral values are true regardless of what the individual thinks. Individuals may acquire knowledge about what moral truths are and learn to abide by them, but they are not determined or depend on the individual. We'll return in a bit to the moral argument, but I first wanted to take a look at a few specific critiques Michael and David had of my challenge. I suspect it would be helpful to have a quick summary of the challenge first. Fortunately, David gave a pretty good one. This is his challenge to Christians. So the yellow portion there, the yellow portion is going to be things that the Bible says uh, are right and wrong. Um, and that therefore are supposed to be written on people's hearts, but would not be part of the green area. In other words, you would not conclude, you would not believe those things um, from the perspective of just maximizing well-being. So he said, you know, again, if, if, if something like do unto others as you would have them do unto you, he could say, yeah, 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 but we would believe the same thing. And so it would be in the green area. I'm saying, what do you have in the yellow area that is written on people's hearts or in, in their conscience, but would not be part of, of maximizing well-being. Now, the first critique the pair made was in regard to a definition of morality I put on screen. For my Christian viewers, this was by far the biggest complaint about my video. So much so that many stopped right here and never actually even got to the challenge. Would that be uh, your definition of morality? No, and to be fair, I did talk to him Sunday about it, and he said he wasn't really nailed down to this definition. Mm -hmm. I was attempting to define it as vaguely as possible, in order to include as many takes on morality as possible. And obviously, I did so poorly. As I clarified on Twitter, I welcome the viewer to bring literally any definition of morality they wish when providing an answer. To be fair, he said, you know... It, he wasn't nailed to this. It's just try, he, it wasn't part of his main argument. By far the best way to do this would have been to include no definition at all. A tact I had properly used for the remainder of the challenge. But as we'll see, I was equally critiqued for lack of specificity on those. But on this definition, all David and Michael said about it was very fair. And if I had to do it all over again, I'd not include this nor any definition of morality with the challenge. It did far more harm than good in communicating effectively. That probably has to do with why you said he's he's pretty cool atheist, right? If he if he's willing to say, you know, well, okay, well, I'm not, uh, have, yeah. I might have to rethink that. So, okay, that's good. All right, so let's go here. Or maybe they're a psychopath whose moral evaluations exclude everyone but themselves. Hey, you know, first of all, why does everyone have to diss psychopaths? If you're a Apologia fan who came over here for the first time... <laughs> <laughs> Dave is a psychopath. I was diagnosed as a psychopath when I was uh, 18 years old. I'm so sorry, David. I didn't actually know this about you or suspect that you'd ever watch the video. But in my defense, you'll notice that this is in no way a diss. No judgments here. They gave me this uh, report and stuff, and it says uh, uh, people like David Wood are incapable of remorse. And I, I, I so disliked being told what I can and can't do that I was like, what? How do you, how can you tell me I'm incapable of remorse? And then I was like, and then I stopped and thought, like, have I ever felt remorse in my life? And no, I know, I didn't even know, I don't even know what you guys mean when you're talking about that. So, uh, if anything, this story actually ingratiates you to me, David. Maybe we could be friends. I, I, I know he's trying to use these for lack of a better term, but I, I would say there really is no such thing as Bible morality. The Bible has moral claims in it but we don't say that morality necessarily 
keyword necessarily has to come from the Bible. The Bible clarifies, repeats, you know, claims or gives moral claims, but morality, especially in where we say comes from in metaethics, if you're a moral realist like Christians typically are, it comes from intuition. In Romans chapter two, God has written the law in our hearts. That will come up later. Notice if you come up with like a generic term like Bible morality and we would, mm -hmm. in order to be clear, we'd have to say, tell us exactly what you mean by Bible morality so that later when you're talking about it, you don't import some other interpretation, some other understanding or, or meaning of what you're saying there. I was very deliberately vague about Bible morality because I wanted to allow the responder to bring to the challenge literally whatever denomination or interpretation of Christian ethics that they personally hold. As you may know, virtually no two Christians would fully agree on morality as the reviewers note. Because my moral framework in terms of normative ethics is virtue ethics. Yeah, and, yeah. I don't need to invoke Christianity to explain my normative ethics. My virtue, eth I hold to virtue ethics. I, I, but there are other Christians who are deontologists. They yeah. hold to more of a Kantian version. So yeah, again, I, are, I don't think yeah, really and there are, there are divine command theorists. And so you have all kinds, mm -hmm. you have all sorts of, yeah, you have, all, you have all kinds. I would be a sort of combination. I would combine elements of, of multiple views. It would have been a huge barrier to the thought experiment if this non-Christian had attempted to tell Christians what Christian morality should be. I don't know. It just doesn't, it, it, it puts a bad feeling or it gives me a bad like thing. Like that's just not the right term for it. Perhaps Christian God morality would have been better or maybe the laws written on the hearts of people. I just mean literally whatever moral framework you as a Christian, adhere to. If anyone has a better suggested term for this, please let me know in the comments. It was him saying that the blue represents um, maximizing well-being uh, for whatever he said and the greatest number of beings. <laughs> the reason I have a problem with that, ladies and gentlemen, is if you say over the greatest number of beings, then you should annihilate humanity. Too many mouths, not enough to go around. And when we faced extinction, I offered a solution. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague, and we are the cure. If you mean greatest number of beings, notice you're not just talking about human beings here, right? You're talking about uh, dogs, cats, uh, you're talking about ants, you're talking about all kinds of insects, worms, you're talking about trees. Many would advocate that a sophisticated and long-term moral framework would necessarily extend beyond humans to the other life on the planet, which is exactly why I didn't limit this. Though instead of the elimination of humans, we can advocate for better behavior from humans, which could even include encouragement of voluntary child-free living. It's disturbing to me how many Christians reject care of the planet as a moral imperative. And I think that the idea that God made humans special and different is a part of this short-sightedness. Even if we said sentient life, you know, things with things, you know, feelings and senses and so on, you just got to get rid of humans because most other beings are going to be much better off without us messing around with them. This is an unsophisticated view of well-being that fails to take into account that the potential range of wellness is wider for some life than for others. That the best well-being for a dog is going to contribute more to maximal well-being than the most happy blade of grass that ever lived. To be clear, at no point during this challenge do I advocate for any moral system only pointing out that maximizing well-being has remarkable explanatory power for the morality experienced by most, including that humans tend to care more for creatures that are more like us than we do for those that are less like us. It seems strange to me that whatever objective morality is applies only and specifically to one particular species, but that it is described as existing even if that species didn't. Perhaps a topic for another video. In general, very few people even attempted to provide an answer to the challenge question, but instead tried to quibble with the maximize well-being hypothetical construct. Notice, as soon as you start saying what it is to maximize well-being, guess what? Uh, Hitler was trying to maximize well-being. Has the internet forgotten Godwin's law? Is that no longer a thing? I adult. Let them say whatever they want. People used to say a lot of nasty things about me. Obviously, humans can be wrong about what will actually maximize well-being. We have limited information and significant biases. As my video acknowledges, the smaller the scope of whom a person includes in their consideration of well-being, the more selfish and immoral they can appear to those with a broader view. This is why my hypothetical construct is hypothetical. 
David's example is actually an excellent demonstration of how short-term selfishness isn't a long-term well-being strategy. The rest of the world rose up because of the imbalance. Like others, David tried to come up with a scenario where the action best in line with maximizing well-being might be unclear. What do you do in a situation where, uh, you know, you'd have to put your own life at risk in order to run into this building and try to save this baby? Um, what you could say is, you know, well, you you should, you know, maybe, hey, you're you're older. You know, I'm talking about from a strictly biological maximizing well-being perspective. And went on for a while attempting to do some hypothetical math as Mike grew restless. That wouldn't be simply going with you maximizing well-being, right? Because, you know, if, you, if let, let's suppose you thought there's a, a 30% chance that this baby is alive, right? Because uh, you look up there and you see all these flames. You say you, th you think there's a 30% chance that you might get in there, get the baby and make it out alive. And you think there's a 70% chance you're just going to die. Again that each individual human doesn't have sufficient information to actually determine what actions will maximize well-being is unsurprising. But that so many scenarios have ambiguity, give us pause, and that different people will act differently in the same situation without either eventual choice considered to cross a line of immorality reinforces the notion that it is merely the act of striving that validates well-being explanatory power. Nor is it relevant or surprising that we all use moral heuristics. A heuristic being a cognitive shortcut one develops to ease decision making, rather than consciously analyzing all the variables for each action taken. A tendency to value youth in survival situations may be harsh, but pragmatically lends itself to long-term survival of a species. That we have this tendency, even in the face of self-preservation, is further evidence for my later points. He was a guy who escaped from prison, and a guard ran after him and fell into the ice. Willem saw this, turned around, and went around and saved his life. The enemy soldier then arrested him, took him back to prison, and executed him a few days later. Better to be moral and then be executed a couple days later. So morality is something different than survival. Mm -hmm. Again, a short-sighted view of maximizing well-being. The tribe, the society is better off when individuals are willing to exercise self-sacrifice for the good of others. Long-term group survival isn't the same as individual survival. Extreme altruism poses no conflict to long-term well-being considerations. There were more similar quibbles, but let's get back to the challenge and see if it has anything to say about the moral argument for God. Uh, go through that video series and get the terms down. Well, there's a reason I didn't include terms like normative ethics and moral ontology. And that's because my video was geared to the average Christian who engages with me on social media, insisting that morality is impossible without God, or without borrowing it from a Christian worldview. That would be false. Yeah. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying some Christians have never said that. That might very well be true, because as I was trying to say earlier, when you get into ethics, I don't think the English language is, is equipped to really handle ethics. I think mm -hmm. sometimes it's not, doesn't have the right terminology. And so I wanted to relay a thought experiment using imagery and a simple tweet-length question. And that's confusing moral epistemology with moral ontology. Perhaps from your perspective it is. But it's my perspective that the entire idea of moral ontology is an exercise in begging the question. An argument that assumes the conclusion. The philosophical equivalent of asking, who created the universe? It assumes a creator, just as Mike and others assume moral truths and duties. Moral ontology isn't merely identifying moral grounding. It's an evaluation of whether these things exist at all. So an argument attempting to demonstrate that moral grounding doesn't exist, or at least isn't needed, is specifically addressing moral ontology. Rejecting ontology isn't avoiding the question, and pointing to the observable as support isn't necessarily retreating to epistemology. But I digress. So I don't think we would ever say, and we're, you and I would not say, that moral motivations would be impossible without God, because... The subject could always do it. You would not, but other Christians do. And those people don't understand the phrase ontology any better than you think I do. And so, I may or may not have failed miserably in my endeavors, in your opinion, but I sincerely was attempting to speak of ontology, just not in so many words. But now that we're using the terms openly, let's see if I can do any better in your eyes. What is an example of something in the yellow portion that you think most non-believers would agree with instinctively, presumably because it is both objectively true and written on our hearts? Nothing. That's my argument. Nothing. 
there being the same thing. I don't know. I would just say nothing. I would just agree with him. There is nothing. Well, that's mildly surprising. Mike agrees with me. So, is that it? Do we call it a day? Has my challenge disproved the need for God for morality? He's talking in this whole thing about normative ethics. You know, like we have to maximize well-being or we have to survive, whatever the normative claim is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God is not necessary. No one argues from normative ethics to God's existence. It's about moral ontology. Mm -hmm. So when he presented this moral challenge, he was trying to get to this point that God is not necessary to explain it. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, but again, the moral argument is in moral ontology, not normative ethics. So the challenge is a non-starter to really make the Christian think about if God is necessary, because God still is necessary in terms of moral ontology, mm -hmm. not normative ethics. I mean, that was never the point. Is that what's happening here? Have I missed the point of the moral argument? Does my challenge not address this alleged grounding? Let's review Michael's version once again. Premise one, morality is a rational enterprise. Premise two, moral realism is true meaning moral facts and duties exist. Premise three, the moral problems and disagreements among humans are too much for us to assume moral facts and duties are grounded in a human source of rationality. Premise four, moral facts and duties are grounded in a necessary rational source. Premise five, this source, whoever this would be, is what we call God. Again, in Mike's words, moral facts and duties exist. Moral facts and duties are grounded in a rational source. And this source is what we call God. It is this assertion that my challenge attempts to test. Do we have any reason to think that moral facts exist? Is there any phenomenon that is better explained with moral facts than without them? It's starting up a change. Like we, we don't really need God. And again, as I've said, no one makes the claim that we need God to understand normative ethics. And to review what he means. Normative ethics looks at what we ought to be doing. So we have all the humans asking, what ought I be doing? which is their normative ethics. And per Mike, we don't need God to understand this. I agree completely. We don't need God to understand what morality is. The moral argument is not about understanding morality. It's about what it actually is. How do we ground it? Okay, Michael, how do we ground it? So think of science. Mm -hmm. Science is grounded in the natural world. But how we come to learn science is, of course, would be ep epistemic, epistemology. But science is ontologically grounded in the natural world. So it's not just like a social construct, like some people want to say. Likewise, in morality, in ethics, you could say that uh, there are objective moral values and duties that are beyond us. That's what they ontologically are. Interesting analogy. In science, we adjudicate what best aligns with reality by running experiments, evaluating previous data, and ultimately making successful predictions about future data. What are the equivalent mechanisms by which we can test against moral truth? From Michael's video series. In the sciences, we decide between theories on the basis of observations, which have an important degree of objectivity. It appears that in moral reasoning, moral intuitions play the same role which observations do in science. We test general moral principles and moral theories by seeing how their consequences conform or fail to conform to our moral intuitions about particular cases. Which he affirms in this critique. How we come to know about that is through intuition. If you're a moral realist, like Christians typically are, it comes from intuition. In Romans chapter 2, God has written the law in our hearts. Which seems somewhat problematic as a standard of measurement since the moral intuition of one person may vary drastically from the moral intuition of another person. What's important right now is to remember that intuition of what God has put in our hearts is the mechanism Michael puts forth to determine moral facts and duties. Because the idea of moral facts and duties are real and objective is self-evident and is our intuitive starting point. Self-evident is in the eye of the beholder. What's self-evident to you isn't necessarily self-evident to me. And my intuition is that there are not moral facts and duties. It seems we're at an impasse. But I'm open to be convinced. We have to remember, moral realism is intuitive. Moral facts and duties are simply self-evident and intuitive. If we see a child getting tortured, none of us would think that is simply how other people see the world and we should move on. No, we all feel that must be stopped and justice should be done. Wait a minute. Isn't objection to child torture a normative ethic? Isn't this arguing from normative ethics to a moral truth and therefore God? No one argues from normative ethics to God's existence. Oh, my mistake then. It sure seems like objective morality advocates point to commonly held normative ethic positions as their evidence. 
politics. I've been in debates with atheists before where they seem to think that what what we mean by objective morality is things that everyone agrees on, um, or things that, that most people agree on. Uh, guys, the, the idea of objective objective morality or an objective moral standard or objective moral duties or something like that is, it wouldn't matter if every last person on the entire planet rejected it. It would still be objectively true. Gotcha, David. Moral facts are unrelated to what we believe about morality, but... Moral facts and duties are simply self-evident and intuitive. Moral facts exist. We know moral facts through our intuition. But if your intuition is different from moral facts, then the moral fact still exists. This sounds like a circular, potentially unfalsifiable claim. But I really want to test its predictive power. So since Mike tells me this is analogous to science, I came up with a competing hypothesis and devised an experiment. If, in fact, morality must be grounded in something, what other ways could it be grounded? And would such grounding explain the data? I cannot fathom how you ground your moral claims and views in naturalism. Well, my video and challenge put forth one possible way to ground it. A desire to avoid pain and to seek thriving are entirely survival traits. They're fully grounded in biology. Oh, In fact, David repeated the sentence three times. That is very interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and back it up just so we make sure we're not misrepresenting him because we try not to do that. Throughout the entire 90-minute stream, they accused me of completing ontology and epistemology. My main problem with this video is there's a lot of conflating going on between the different branches of ethics. And moral ontology is... What are they grounded in? And yet... When I say the phrase grounded in biology, and it is played back three times, I'm accused of not trying to address what morality is grounded in. It's one thing if you want to explain to me why biology in the natural world isn't an appropriate grounding, but according to Mike, Science is ontologically grounded in the natural world. So if the natural world is sufficient ontological grounding for science, it doesn't seem unreasonable to hypothesize the natural world as ontological grounding for morality. So feel free to tell me how the natural world ontology is insufficient, but don't tell me that I wasn't at least attempting a discussion about ontology. They almost never state accurately what our argument is. Okay, so my competing hypothesis is that one could ground morality in the concept of maximizing well-being, which itself is sufficiently ontologically grounded in the natural world, the same ontological grounding that Mike attributes to science. Next, we'll want to see if either of the ontological hypotheses better explain the data of normative ethics. My critics seem to agree that the challenge seems to prove that nothing in normative ethics is better described by God-based moral truths than by natural world-based maximizing well-being. I would just agree with him. There is nothing. And yet, despite their protestations, they seem to appeal to normative ethics as part of their evidence for moral truths. We have some sort of common moral moral belief. We have we believe that it's wrong to torture old ladies for fun. It's wrong to torture innocent children. It's possible I'm reading the situation wrong. And whether they do or they don't, it seems everyone agrees that normative ethics are equally explained by either hypothesis. God still is necessary in terms of moral ontology. Mm -hmm. Not normative ethics. I mean, that was never the point. All right. So what ontological evidence should we consider? I trust that all Christians would affirm that biology exists and that the natural world exists. So everyone agrees that the natural world hypothesis at least exists. What about the evidence for the moral truth hypothesis? Well... Moral facts and duties are simply self-evident and intuitive. Now that's problematic because moral truths are not self-evident to me nor are they intuitive to me. So this evidence of the existence of moral truths is inconclusive. Left with two hypotheses that provide sufficient ontological grounding and equally explain the data, but one source is agreed by all to exist with a preponderance of observations and unmatched predictive power, and the other source is affirmed only by the intuition of a subset of people, which should we go with? Obviously, nothing here actually falsifies the moral truth hypothesis, in part because no one has proposed a falsification criteria. However, by Occam's razor, the explanation with the smallest number of assumptions is generally correct. Or more precisely, entities should not be multiplied without necessity. And as we've shown, moral truths, and thereby God, are not a necessity here. They need not exist. I would agree with Frank Turk that you, you seem to be borrowing them from somewhere else and you just don't realize it. Nope. 
I'd love to put that outlandish, ridiculous assertion to bed once and for all. Maybe God exists, maybe he doesn't. But nothing about moral ontology seems to require one. How does this sit with you, David? If he's saying that our species is wired, is wired... Just like these responders took issue with some of my definitions, I don't love David's use of the word wired to describe the evolutionary advantage of traits that prioritize well-being. But they were charitable with me, so I will too, and we'll move on with the objection noted. To seek their own well-being. And so you're, you're, you know, you're wired to seek your well-being. And, you know, part of seeking your well-being is that you're wired to seek your, your family's well-being. And uh, we just kind of have kind of a herd instinct that makes us want to help others. If that's what you mean when you say that um, stealing is wrong or killing is wrong, is that it somehow conflicts with um, our herd instinct to sort of seek the general well-being or something like that. I would say, no, as far as arguments are concerned, God would not be necessary for that. We agree. God is not necessary. But I sense a but. No. We're assuming that you guys mean something beyond that. We don't. We're assuming that when you say uh, that you shouldn't torture old ladies for fun, we are assuming you mean something beyond, you know, I was wired by, you know, biological processes to not like that sort of thing uh, because it, it conflicts with my herd instinct. We don't mean something beyond that. We can empathize that we don't want to be tortured when we are old, so would prefer a world where old people aren't tortured. That's all we mean. We're assuming that you mean something beyond that. We don't. Because if you don't, if all you mean is, no, that's the way I was, you know, that's kind of what I was, I was wired to do. Again, what do you do with people who are wired to do massively horrible things? Here's where David's wired colloquialism doesn't capture the scenario well. He's referring to people for whom maximizing well-being isn't a priority, or maybe less of a priority than for others. There's clearly a spectrum of options here. The things one perceives as horrible are described as such because they go against that person's idea of well-being. The individual doing the horrible things wouldn't see it as going against their particular priorities. How is it more right for you to follow your wiring and wrong for them to follow their wiring? Words like right or wrong don't have an objective universal meaning. They describe how well an action aligns with the goal or desired outcomes. Those who share goals will use common descriptors. Good things align with those goals, bad things don't align with those goals. Those who don't share goals, won't. The fact that people tend to spend most of their lives beside people who have similar goals is part of what feeds this illusion of absolute standards. But when we look, we see a spectrum of morality in the real world. And this is far better explained by naturalism than by the idea of absolute standards that can be neither defined nor agreed upon. If you say it's right for you to follow the way you're wired and wrong of them to follow the way they're wired, then you're appealing to some standard that's beyond your wiring. First of all, that one might consider that those who are different are inferior doesn't require an absolute standard. You might consider it wrong to put pineapple on a pizza, but that doesn't require some sort of absolute pizza standard. A Republican will consider that a Democrat has made a wrong choice, and so on. Wrong is practically synonymous with disagreement. Second, like virtually all disagreements that eventually resolve, it would happen in one of three ways. One, by negotiation, appealing to common interests. Two, by proclamation of an authority. Or three, by force. Christians really, really want to imagine that they can invoke an invisible authority in the case of any tiebreaker. The trouble is that both parties have to recognize an authority before the proclamation of said authority holds weight. I'm sure it is frustrating for Christians to feel like they have authority, but other parties just not recognize it. This is why appealing to common interest is much more effective. One can get a lot of people on board the anti-torture for fun side of the issue merely through an appeal to empathy. No authority needed. It's more difficult to appeal to common interest on something like anti-gay marriage, because inequality of opportunity for many seems worse than accommodating the personal distaste of a few. That's why as society gets more comfortable with homosexuality, people who are against it are left with authority as their only leg to stand on. And of course, force is the least appealing choice for most, because force might favor any side of an issue which is why Christians put it forth as a scare tactic to those with whom they can't find common ground and who might otherwise reject their authority. 
See David's Hitler example from earlier. As nice as it might be to have a dispute resolution mechanism that will instantly and always rule in your favor, that doesn't mean you can invent one. In the real messy world of morality, the only resolution strategy that works is to appeal to common goals and common ground. The morality argument needs to rest on something more concrete than the what if we don't agree appeal to emotion. When you start uh, condemning God for not doing this, when you say God ought to have revealed himself or something like that, you're, you're, you're making moral claims and you're saying that our rules would even apply to God. No, I'd be saying that if God valued the same things that I value, then he would act in a way consistent with those values. Since some claim to know what God values, the actions depicted in the Bible can be compared to those value claims to see if they match up. The assumption here is that you mean something more than that, and atheists generally do. You know what they say about assumptions? People who haven't given a lot of thought to their own moral epistemology or ontology can slide naturally into imprecise and unexamined language expressing merely the natural, visceral impulse that one's own conclusions should be labeled as right and opposing conclusions should be labeled wrong, even while simultaneously intellectually acknowledging a lack of universal standard, were they to think about it. As Mike points out, language is messy. This is just one reason why everyone should take some time to think about morality and learn more about it. As far as I'm concerned, it's a simple question. What is the status of a claim like, uh, you know, don't murder or something like that. Don't, don't torture old ladies for fun. What, what's the, what is, defend that for me in a way that is consistent with your worldview as a, as a naturalist. I believe I just did. Defend it in a way that um, if some other naturalist who didn't agree with you, someone who thought it was fine to kill, uh, should be compelled to accept. Okay, well, that's literally begging the question. You're demanding that a relative moralistic framework must carry an incompatible feature of objective morality in order for you to acknowledge it. Provide me an apple that is also an orange. Since naturalistic frameworks don't posit an external authority, conflict must be resolved by way of rational appeal. There's no automatic win mechanism that gives Christians a cheat code to avoid logical appeals. No father figure to come in and resolve a sibling conflict. And if objective morality is synonymous with maximizing well-being, as you claim, then why do you need the compulsion option in the first place? You should always have the most convincing argument with no appeal to authority necessary. You don't have to compel them when you can convince them. In other words, there's something on your worldview that you can say. He, see, because of our, uh, our worldview, we know that this moral claim is true. Under my worldview, claims are true only relative to a goal. Those who share common goals can find common truth. Those with incompatible goals won't be able to find common truth. If I'm trying to play chess and you're trying to play checkers, we're not going to agree on how the pieces should move. This matches perfectly with observation of how the world actually works. That's what I'd, I'd like to say, but I've never seen it. Never seen anything close to it. Because you're asking to see a married bachelor or a square circle, then declaring victory when one isn't produced. You've got some problems here. You have some massive problems. And at the end of the day, I don't think you really believe that. Because if so, then you couldn't condemn other societies and so Again, I can absolutely condemn someone else for not adhering to my own personal preference standard. People do it every day. I don't think the Christmas lights should be on before American Thanksgiving. And I 100% condemn people who do it. I acknowledge that they are not obligated to adhere to my personal standard. And if I want them to keep their lights off until Black Friday, then I'll have to find common ground and make a rational appeal. My condemnation isn't enough. And there will be some with whom no common ground can be found. And we will both condemn the other, despite a lack of ultimate Christmas light authority. This is no different than Mike and David having an intuition that moral truths exist, and my intuition that moral truths do not exist. No appeal to authority solves this impasse. Both of us have to look for points of agreement to build off of in order to actually convince the other, which is what I'm trying to do with Christians in this challenge. Establish some baselines, some common ground. Based on the video, I seem to understand um, Apologia's view of of uh, of morality, as far as what it is, it's sort of wired into us by evolution mm -hmm. because we're we're uh, the, the evolution has produced um, creatures that have to survive because you wouldn't have survived if you weren't wired like that, and so we're sort of wired to seek the well-being of uh, of human beings uh, and so on. Right. Well, I didn't actually put forth my own view. 
What I presented was a form of natural moral realism similar to that promoted by Sam Harris and others. This works well as a simple and sufficient counter to theistic moral relativism, in that it grants the idea that morals might actually be grounded in something for the sake of the argument, that common ground I spoke of. My own view is a little more complicated and still evolving with new learning all the time, acknowledging other moral inputs like brain chemistry, societal pressures, and personal experience that combine with evolutionary biological imperatives for a full spectrum of diverse moral viewpoints, none of which requires moral truths. But that's not important right now. All right, so uh, Apologia, if you're watching this, I am. If you get a chance, because it seems to be the route you're going, and you want it, you're trying to give accurate, uh, you know, arguments and so on, uh, to to lay out your argument in more careful terms, where we're not able to just say, hey, you you don't seem to understand the difference between moral epistemology and moral ontology, or no, that's not what we mean by objective morality, or uh, what exactly do you mean by Bible morality and stuff? Is you clear, lay out all your definitions, and then then you might give us something to, to worry about. Well, David, if you're watching this. I thank you for taking the time to humor this relative philosophical illiterate with your time. If you get a chance, because this seems to be the route you're going, and you want to give accurate arguments and so on, to lay out your argument in more careful terms. How can you demonstrate that morality requires ontological grounding in the first place? What evidence can you provide for the existence of moral truths beyond your personal intuition and appeals to normative ethics? If intuition is how we learn moral truths, on what basis can you say that your intuition is right and my intuition is wrong? What observation about morality is insufficiently explained by grounding in biology in the natural world? Please explain how, in a dispute situation, appealing to an unrecognized authority is functionally different than merely expressing a personal moral preference. Do that, and then you might give me something to worry about. Thanks for watching.